Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's guest is a fellow podcaster and public speaker like myself, which got me thinking about public speaking. What is it? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Public speaking is the act or process of making speeches in public. It is the art of effective oral communication with an audience. In short, it is an oral presentation given live, and topics can vary widely. Business, healthcare, cryptocurrency, and so on. And the goal is to do one of three things, educate, entertain, or influence. This is not the same as an online presentation that is available online forever or until the link is deleted. Public speaking is typically a specific time or place. For example, next week I'll be presenting at a national conference in Atlanta and I have three public speaking events in three days. These presentations are done live, in person, and will not be recorded for later viewing. The origins of public speaking can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome without the PowerPoint presentation. They use public speaking as a way to praise and persuade others. In fact, the Greeks used to call public speaking rhetoric, which is the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing. Eventually, Rome adopted public speaking as part of their Senate, and Latin style of public speaking became popular in the U.S. and Europe around the mid-20th century. But why is public speaking important? Entrepreneurs must learn to win over a crowd. The goal is to persuade and inform customers of products or services. It is the sales pitch. Public speaking is also important to motivate others. The role of a speaker is to influence the listeners in hopes of creating an engaging audience. I always use personal stories to motivate others. I talk about my family, my upbringing, my career, and my missteps. I use these stories to motivate. The goal is to highlight my trials and tribulations and to remind the audience, if I can be successful, anyone can. And that is why an entrepreneur should care. Everyone encounters a situation where public speaking skills become necessary. I know, I know. To an extrovert, this sounds like the worst thing to hear. And maybe it doesn't sound too bad to an extrovert. But public speaking skills are essential. One former guest, a real estate investor, said the best investment he ever made was investing in Toastmasters, where members learn leadership skills such as listening, planning, motivating, and speaking in public, and gives members an opportunity to practice those skills. Another former guest is doing training on how to be super bold, a training on building confidence. Want to learn more? Go sign up for the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. As an entrepreneur, public speaking will lead to opportunities, boost confidence, critical thinking, and improve communication skills. It also helps the entrepreneur reach people faster. Social media is great if the post goes viral, and the best reels are under 30 seconds. While public speaking, the entrepreneur has the opportunity to hold the crowd for a longer period of time, instantly inspiring many. Public speaking helps bring the message come to life much better than any billboard or poster ever could do. However, as a public speaker, be prepared. A good speech makes sense. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. Research the topic thoroughly and be prepared to answer follow-up questions about the speech. Still feeling uneased? Practice the speech out loud in front of a mirror with a small group of friends. I recall getting my first training job and sitting in a training room, training in an empty classroom. Just a room full of computers preparing myself for my first training in a few weeks. Fun fact, I hated public speaking until I learned how to do it. Everyone starts at the beginning. Remember that, entrepreneurs. We are pioneers without frontiers. We are a globe of innovators. We are entrepreneurs, and we have something to say. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Yeah.
This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with a fellow podcaster, but that's not all this gentleman does. He does a lot, which we will get into. Mark Drager, how are we doing, buddy? I am doing amazing. You know what? I'm going to say that he does a lot. It seems to be a theme that most of us <laughs> entrepreneurs run into, right? Other duties as assigned, as it is at this, as the saying goes. So, so Mark, let's let's introduce the world to you for the listeners at home. Who is Mark? Yeah, I mean, there's 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 many different shades of me. Uh, I'm I'm a husband, uh, and actually, my wife and I are about to celebrate our 22nd anniversary. Nice, together, so nice. I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty it's chuffed about that. We were high school sweethearts. Uh, I'm a dad of of four kids, and uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And and being an entrepreneur means that it's really just code for making money doing whatever you love. And so uh, I own a creative agency that helps with with branding and creative production. And that got me, you know, seven, eight years ago now into podcasting and into content production. And so I wear a lot of different hats. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I've been doing, you were talking about this before. I've been doing this podcast for about a year now, a little over a year. And the amount of experience I've gotten in areas I never thought I would get, like podcast editing, website design graphic design. It's like all these different mediums that I'm kind of getting into, which has been really, really fun. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, it, I, I tell people when you own an agency of any kind, any, any time, whether it's an advertising agency or a marketing agency or whatever it might be, if you're a lawyer or an accountant, it doesn't matter. Your clients are in all of these different industries and all of these different verticals. And the more that you help them, the, the more you learn. And so I spent the last, what, 15 years now uh, not only building my own business, but building every one of my clients' businesses in all of these weird industries. You know, we have a client who is is one of the leaders in retail, store, design, and building. Oh, interesting. And so this morning, I was having a conversation with him about frictionless retail and what's happening within Friction? like, what frictionless is friction? retail. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What well, is it's the this? term. It's the term used to help make the purchasing decisions uh, for for for. Uh, shoppers buyer journeys in stores as simple as online let's say so maybe you go into a store that has no staff maybe on your app you scan all the items that you purchase as you put it in your cart and then you just walk out that's frictionless retail you know self checkout is frictionless retail uh, buy online pick up in store so so here's the thing it's like i'm a marketer who's a podcast host those are the those are the main hats that i wear and yet you want to talk about the transportation industry? You want to talk about um, uh, 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 pension plans? You want to talk about insurance? Like, I spent 15 years in all these weird industries. So, <laughs> <laughs> man, I love talking about pensions. Don't even get me started about pension plans. Oh my yeah, you want to come, talk about direct? My benefit? wife will come down here and punch him in the face, and anymore she hears about 401k pension plan. <laughs> well, do you want a DC versus a DB pension plan? There's man, different I, kinds. I, right? there you go. want the 403? You want the 457? You know, we got some different choices. We're nonprofit over here, baby. <laughs> so we got some <laughs> options. All right. So you you know you mentioned Mark. You mentioned you actually do podcasting. You have the other host. So kind of explain what is it exactly all that your business does and, and how did you create this brand? Yeah, so, so back in 2006, I launched my, my agency, Phantom Media, and we started as a video production company. Now, video today is like, you know, you pick up your phone <laughs> and everything is video. Instagram last summer said, hey, we're no longer a photo platform. We're now a video platform. Yep. But back in 2006, we were shooting on tape. We would take that tape and digitize it into a computer, and then we would still, we would still compress everything for dial-up. Like, like YouTube was, wasn't even owned by Google yet. Facebook was just launching where you could put photos on them. Like, this was a long time ago. And so I started this, this agency, this video production company, and we focused on corporate video, which became communications over the years, which then suddenly we find ourselves doing marketing. And then we find ourselves doing advertising. And, and before we know it, we're growing. And by 2013, 14, 15, 16, we're doing like national television campaigns and radio campaigns. And we're working with the NBA and we're working with all of these great people. 
And so my own agency had this journey as media, as the internet, as, as, as our world continued to change, as social media came online. And as I mentioned all along, I, I love the idea of giving back like most entrepreneurs do. You know, we have our passion, we have our purpose. And eventually you want to give back. And, and the easiest way to do that, you can, you can start a blog, you can go on, the, on a speaking tour, you can start a podcast. And so back in maybe 2014, I think it was, I started podcasting. And I fell in love with it. Like, I fell in love with uh, the chance to, like you, like, like anyone who has a podcast, to be able to, to connect with amazing people and ask great questions and, and have great conversations. And what happened was, though, I found that I was spending a lot of time at work doing the things I had to do so that way I could spend a tiny bit of time doing the things I love to do. You know, I had to worry about production. I had to worry about finance. I had to worry about sales. I had to worry about payroll. You know, we were a multi-million dollar company, so seven-figure payroll. And I had to worry about all this stuff so that way I could spend a few hours a week or maybe, just maybe, a few years later, I could do the things that I really loved. And I love hosting conversations. I love having a podcast. I love hosting panels on stage and helping people MC live events. And I love all those things. And so it was only in the last year that we actually decided that I'm not going to live this double life. I'm not going to wear these, these two hats. I'm not going to spend all my time doing the stuff that I have to do so that way I can spend a tiny bit of time doing the things I love to do. And so we pivoted the agency to bring everything together. Nice. Nice. Now, why, why did you feel that was the time to kind of pivot? Well, a few things, uh, owning, a. a, a, a multi-million dollar production company when COVID hit, you, you, you may imagine that all of our corporate clients and all of our massive projects, uh, our, our six-figure projects, instantly got canceled or put on hold. And so going Ouch. into COVID, I had 24 full-time staff. And at this point, our, our company's down to four full-time staff. So that was, that was a bit of a hard uh, time, a hard period. Our revenues pretty much fell by 70% very, very quickly. Wow. And so I, I had the decision, though, for the first time in my life, I could shut down my agency. I could go get a job. I could change it. I realized that I had built this company that, that, that honestly, I kind of felt trapped in. I would have these moments of realization that for everyone on my team and every one of my clients, whatever we were working on was, was a stepping stone in their career path. But my company wasn't a stepping stone in my career path. My company yeah, was all was, I had. It, yeah, was, it, it was, was it was the only stone. Yeah, it was it. And uh, and and COVID actually helped give me the 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 time, the coverage. It forced me to make a lot of hard decisions and face a lot of hard truths. But uh, in doing so, I realized that that I still do love this. I love creating um, great spaces. And live events allow for great spaces. I love creating great conversations like we're having today where we can dig into real things. And I love designing and building brands and, and uh, business models and working with entrepreneurs and with speakers and coaches and consultants, people who have a real purpose. And the work that they, that they do helps people. And after coming out of 15 years of corporate and all those industries that I mentioned, where sometimes you're pouring your heart and soul into something that at the end of the day, it doesn't really do very much for anyone. You know, I, I realized that I love this. I just didn't love what I was doing or, or maybe who I was doing it for. And that I had the power to fix it. You know, that, that was really the truth. Yeah. Nice. Now let's, let's take it a step back. I, yeah. I want to talk about how I think a lot of listeners will be very curious to know, how do you scale a multi-million dollar business while working in the corporate world? Well, I mean, we went, we went, the advice I got early on, I started my business when I was 23. I quit my $45,000 a year job. My wife just had just had our first child. So she was three months old. My wife wasn't working, had no mat leave, had no coverage. And I just went, I'm going to quit my job and start a company. And, uh, and so that was a bit of a risk, but um, people said, go where the money is. And for the most part, that's great advice. Like if you're starting a company, go where the money is because they will be willing to pay for things. 
And so uh, scaling the business after we figured out generation one was not hard. For anyone who's starting anything, once you get the, the people and the systems and the processes all in place and you figure out whatever the first version of something is and it works, often moving to a second or a third or a fourth version of something isn't that challenging as long as you can keep it together. So, for, so the way our agency works, like most service companies, is there's like working groups. And so I need to make my agency work. I need like a video editor. And I need a, a video producer, and I need a project manager, and I need someone who can write and someone who can design. There's four people I need. So, so getting to that first group of being able to hire each of those people was, it started with me doing everything. And then I backed myself out of like the lowest cost thing, which was video editing. So I hired a video editor. And then I was like, oh, I need to get out of production. So I hired a producer. And I just, over the kind of two or three years as our revenues grew, I would just hire someone to replace me at a given skill. And each time I did, it not only freed up my time, but it actually helped us produce better work. Better work meant a stronger portfolio. It meant more referrals. Stronger portfolio, more referrals meant more sales. More sales meant I could hire more people. And so once you get into the first generation or the first version of your business, moving from a team of, say, four to a team of eight, you just have to you know, increase your revenue and then just go out and replicate that team. Nice. And then moving from two teams to three teams, you just have to do the same thing. And I thought that's all I had to do. But then, <laughs> but then you hit like 18, 20, 24 people. You start to introduce different services. And then you realize, oh, scaling a business past that level is a whole different way to think. And, uh, and, and we don't have to get into that. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's continue to start with like the beginning. Now, what was yeah. the difficulty? So how do you differentiate yourself as a, as a brand, you know, as, as a as a marketing brand and, and what you're doing, how do you differentiate yourself for your customers when you're growing your brand or your company at that beginning stage? How did you get to that point where you now have the revenue to bring on new staff? Well, you know, I, I am a brand strategist. And so how I did it isn't how I recommend people actually do it. <laughs> do as so, I say, not as I do. I like it. <laughs> well, no, because it took me three or four years and I wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. Now that I have 15 years of experience, um, I, I often say just because I did it this way doesn't mean it's the one way or the only way to do it. So when, when people are starting creative endeavors or, or, or most service-based businesses, it's a craft. You know, if, if I'm an accountant, then I'm really good at being an accountant. Will I be a good business owner? I don't know. If I'm a graphic designer, I might be an amazing graphic designer. Will I be a good business owner? I don't know. And so the first question I always ask people when they're, when they're starting these types of companies is, do you love the craft? Like if you love graphic design and you just want to spend all day, every day designing, then I don't know if running a multi-million dollar company with 20 or 30 people and worrying about finances and collections and, and operations and management, like you're going to spend all day, every day running the business. You won't spend all day, every day designing like you love. So the first question to ask yourself and the first thing I had that I, I didn't even realize at the time was I didn't love the craft. So, <laughs> so I got super lucky because I could not wait to stop editing and I didn't like going on set. And I, I didn't like, I loved, I loved helping people and I loved the process and I loved helping them figure out stuff, which made me naturally inclined to sales, like the early part of the process. And so I, I challenge everyone to, to, to think about yourself because if you love the process or the craft, you can still own a business, but you'll probably want to bring in a few partners who love the sales or the operations or the other part. Every business needs someone who can help market and sell, sell it. They need someone who can help deliver. And then they need someone who can actually help with the people and the processes. And when you're starting, you're going to do it all yourself and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to bump along the way. But very quickly, if you want to grow, you need to identify what you are strongest at and then either hire people or maybe partner or maybe get vendors, figure out some way to help get the support you need on those other components, because that's the only way to grow. You know, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning stages, you, you had to do it all before you hired these individuals, right? What were some of the difficulties of building your own brand by, or your own company by yourself? The first was in my mind. It was, uh, and a lot of us struggle with this. It was, how can I justify 
you know, back in 2006, I, I think I was charging $600 a day. We charge a lot more now, but back in 2006, I was charging $600 a day. And I thought, how could I justify charging someone $600 for my time when they know it's only me? Like, I can't, I can't say, well, I have a team or I have vendors or I have all these people I have to pay. It was just me. And my, my mindset and what I thought about our work, I, I was struggling to justify paying that. And so we have to realize our value and what we're worth. That, that held me up. The next thing is the natural cycle that comes of, I have, no, I have no work, so I go out and sell. And then when I sell, I have to take the time to deliver the work. So I'm not spending time selling. And now that I'm delivering work, my sales dry up, and then the work dries up, and then I'm back. And it's that cycle of like sales to delivery to sales to delivery. I don't know if there's an elegant solution to it other than you just keep doing that until things kind of get so bananas and so overwhelming that you move up your pricing or you go out and hire people to help you. I mean, that's just the nature of startup. But that was the second challenge. And the third was it took me a while, and I've, I've, had, I've, made, I've had to do this a few more times with each pivot. It just, it took me a while to figure out the, 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 what people wanted, you know, should I package things or not? Should I make things kind of free and build an ascension model where people can upsell or not? Will they come back or not? Am I saying the right thing? Am, am I doing the right thing? When I deliver it, is it the right way? Are they happy at the end? Like all of this stuff just takes time and it takes a certain volume of, of clients or customers or sales to be able to figure this out. If you have a product, you're going to launch the product. You have no idea how much warranty work you're going to have to do. Like you, you hope none, but you don't know until you do. And because I was a perfectionist by, by, by default, I didn't want to risk making those mistakes. I didn't want, I wanted everything to be really quick. And now I've realized one, when you're starting, you're going to kind of make mistakes. You're going to kind of let people down and you're, it's, it's going to happen because it's the only way to learn these lessons. And two, it takes a little bit of time to figure it out. So, so if it is taking time, you're not doing anything wrong. It, just be patient. Keep going. That is what it takes. It'll take six months or a year or three years. However long it takes to figure this out is how long it takes. You know, you started out by saying you, you, you were back in 23, I believe it was your first business. You started your first business and you quit your job. Yeah, 2006. How, how did you finance this? How did, how did you go through the financing? Did you venture capital and grassroots effort? How, <laughs> how did you go through it? Yeah, so, so I, a few months before I quit, I went to the CEO of the company I was working for. And I said, listen, you know, I was doing, I was doing video work the very same way that I started my company. I thought, I thought, listen, if I'm doing video for this one company and I'm making 45000 a year, what if I could get like 10 clients? I could make so much money, right? I could charge more. I, I'm not on payroll. I'm not on salary. So I went to the CEO with, with kind of a proposition. I said, listen, it doesn't make sense for you to have me on payroll. It doesn't make sense for you to continually buy gear and invest in gear and have this team and have no structure over what I'm working on. Why don't you let me leave? Why don't you outsource the work I'm doing to me right now to me or my company? And I'll have my first client to start. He said, great, let's do it. So I took the equipment with kind of this uh, written agreement that I would um, pay it off for work and trade. I uh, asked my mom and, and she, she took out a, a $25,000 line of credit on her home. I, we had that. And uh, I had, gosh, I don't know, I had five or 10 grand maybe saved up in the bank. And so with this free equipment and, with, and, and this kind of promise of work to come, and with this line of credit from my mom and with some money in the bank, I just started. And uh, very talk about bootstrap. Now, a few things happened. One, the work didn't really come from that company because when I left and they realized what they would actually have to pay me, they, they suddenly decided that it wasn't worth it. Um, so that was strike one against me. Strike two, I thought that sales would be a lot easier um, and that I had a really great thing to offer but I was doing such a terrible job of explaining it. New sales weren't really coming in, so I was just kind of desperately leveraging everyone in my network and being very honest and saying, hey, I started this thing. Do you have anything for me? Do you have anything for me? What can you give me? Please, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a husband and a father of a baby, and I started this new thing. So I was just doing anything, like anything at all 
you know, we were a video company, but we were designing landing pages and I was coding HTML in the middle of the night and stuff, just anything for money. And, uh, and then that line of credit was really how we financed it. And, you know, I think for, for entrepreneurs, um, it's very important to realize that one, a lot of these businesses do take some time and energy and it's, it's not a, you you don't happen overnight successes, right? It takes some time. Now you, in fact, mentioned you started your first business, right? How many iterations of businesses have you gone through? You, You now have kind of consolidated the video and graphic design. Is that the, how many other different businesses have you kind of started and did they all now coincide into one giant one? Yeah. So, so I I mean, I've only ever had one corporation because, you know, I've been able to do everything I've wanted to do within that corporation, but, uh, every two or three years I've had to make some pretty major changes to that business. And, and that includes when we were, you know, I said we were doing communications, which became marketing, which became advertising. It meant bringing in new lines of business. So we would, we, in 2016, 2017, we started pivoting from just content production. So just making videos or just making radio commercials or just making television commercials to being more of a performance-based marketing agency. So we would do landing pages and Facebook campaigns and Google campaigns and reporting and management. And so I was running these, these two different business models because my original business, Fanta Creative, it's, um, it's not a recurring revenue business. There's zero recurring revenue. So when we're a multi-million dollar company, it's project-based. We have to replace that work every single year. We would have recurring clients who would kind of bring us new projects here and there. But once the project was done and we got the money, sometimes we wouldn't see a client for two or three or four years even because, because they're like, hey, this is great. I don't need this anymore. And so I was looking for ways to bring more recurring revenue into the business, more predictable revenue in the business, try to, try to not have to replace all of this revenue and all of these projects because we're working at at our peak we were working on two or three hundred projects a year um every single year it was just like a hamster wheel so when i say the businesses i've done a lot of different things we've we've pivoted we've introduced services we've cut services now you know i'm, I'm a professional host um, and an mc and so i help uh, uh conferences and seminars and live events run as smoothly as they can uh, from either in you know on stage or even we direct and produce conferences, but all of that stuff happens within the one company. So why why did you decide to kind of because you, you were kind of talking about passions earlier, right? You're, you're passionate about what is your passion? Well, my my greatest my greatest passion is really I've I've kind of learned I'm I'm a bit like a cheerleader. I get really excited about what could be really, really excited about what could be. And so w- during this COVID lockdown and pandemics and all this stuff, and when I mentioned that I took our creative agency and I decided I'm going to bring everything together, I'm going to bring me as the host, me as the podcast, working with speakers and coaches and um, entrepreneurs and, and the creative agency, I'm going to bring it all together. I did a lot of reflecting. You know, what, what is the work that is our highest value work? What is the stuff that we do better than anyone else? Because there's a lot of stuff that we just did okay or not even great, to be honest with you. So what is the stuff that we're just amazing at? And when I looked back at, at my, my involvement, my work, my passions, I really realized that, um, that I'm like this cheerleader because I really want people to pursue their passions at all costs. And so with the podcasts, with the interviews, with our agencies, the people we're working with, I realized that, that the most successful, most fun, biggest impact projects that we did were when we were helping people pursue their passions. They may have doubt. They may have fear. They may not know what they're doing or even how to do it. But when someone commits, when someone commits to a really bold message or amazing creative or a big idea or they start that company right they are pursuing their passion that last few words at all costs people don't necessarily want to do that and so when i am a part of helping people realize that they can do it and they step up at all costs 
that really gets me excited. Now, what would you say has been difficult about starting? And like, let's, in fact, let's talk about the pandemic. You mentioned you started, uh, had 20 some odd employees and had to come down to four. So let's talk about some of the difficulties of that. What was, what has been difficult about starting this business? Well, uh, I mean, when, when you have a big team, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that I didn't have to do anymore. So I, there, there are some benefits to running a, a company that is successful. Uh, you have access to money. You have money in the bank. You can borrow money. Uh, you, you have a great balance sheet. You have a team. You can just throw stuff to people. You can say, hey, I, we need this done. Can it be done by Tuesday? And then it comes back to me and it's done. That's all amazing. Now, part of, part of what's um, also a lot of fun, though, is every entrepreneur I've ever spoken to at, who has scaled a business and, and, and grown it, they always think in fondness to the times they were in the trenches because there's something really fun and it builds a lot of camaraderie when you're small and when you're nimble and when you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants and when you're figuring things out on the go. It's, it's terrifying for a lot of people, but you will look back on those moments, just like most people look back on high school and go, wow, high school was great, or college was great, right? They look back on those times. When you are starting or you are small, I say this to my COO all the time, uh, you know, we know that, that what we are doing right now in about 12 months is really going to blow up and it's going to change everything. We're going to be at, we're at four people right now. We're probably going to be at 12 to 18 people in about 12 months. And I remind him, look back on this period, this time right now with fondness, even though it's hard and challenging and difficult, because we are going to look back and go, remember, remember when we were doing this? Remember when that project came along? Remember how we pulled that off? Oh, man, it's just, it, it helps you feel alive. And so with the pandemic and with the shift, more than anything, it, it's helped me, remind me that, that we had grown to a place where we were kind of slow. We weren't as focused on sales, on differentiating, on standing out, on taking risks, on trying new things, on thinking really big and bold, because the stakes weren't that high. Like, like I wasn't really going to lose anything. And today, I feel like I'm kind of walking on a tightrope. I kind of feel like, like whew, if this doesn't work out, uh, what next? I need this to work out. I'm taking bigger risks. I'm, I'm more bold. And to be honest, business is more fun when you are in where I am right now than when you're running this kind of slow, big machine. Yeah, you know, one of the things you kind of mentioned pretty consistently is, is the need to be bold, right? And, and, and why that's important. In fact, uh, one of the things you discussed at the beginning of this episode was talking about the risk you took from moving out of your former corporate role and, and deciding to, I'm going to do this full time with a kid on the way, right? And, and married. Why, why is, let's talk about the risk tolerance of an entrepreneur. Why is it, what, what is the risk tolerance in your kind of explanation? What would you, what do you would say was risk tolerance? And then what, what makes that, what is synonymized risk with being an entrepreneur? Well, I, I Outsiders believe that entrepreneurs are risk takers, and I don't think that's true when we start. I think that anyone who starts something is uh, optimistic and perhaps maybe a little foolish. We foolishly believe that we can do it better, that there is a way to make it happen, that it will work out. That, so, so it's not that we are going on to take on risk. Because to me, taking on a risk is when there's a, a real level of uncertainty there. Everyone I know who started a business wasn't, didn't have that uncertainty. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how it will work out and how long it'll take, but, but I know that, that this thing that I'm doing, people will want, right? There's like a real optimism there. It and, really, it's kind of unique. It's like this drive that no matter, we're going to make it, we have the... Uh, if there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The yeah. tunnel might be long and dark and yeah. scary, but shit, we're going to get through this damn tunnel. <laughs> right, right. Now, now I don't want to scare any of our listeners off. Exactly. Here, not but, not but, to, exactly. No, I, but here's I would, the truth. When I would it hits agree, you, though. You know, I agree with you. you. That, that this, is, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. It's going to take yep. way, way longer. Wow, this is way harder than I thought it was going to be. I thought, I thought hard work was enough. It turns out <laughs> it's not. I thought that having the amount of money I had would be enough. I thought that taking a year, it takes three years. Like, 
like once by the time it hits you, <laughs> how how screwed you really are. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> you're and in one of the so you deep. You're in so deep, you don't want to give up. Yeah, and you were talking about, you know, as as entrepreneurs, you kind of commemorate, like in this misery part, right? When you're you're you know really kind of grinding through the grip, you really learn a lot as an entrepreneur. You know, you you go through these stages of even by yourself sometimes, right? Because sometimes you're kind of in this position, you're an entrepreneur, and you're doing it all by yourself, as you mentioned. I'm at this position right now, doing it all by myself, but I'm learning a lot. Right. I'm learning a lot at the same time, but I'm like, I know I'm going to succeed. We're going to make it. We just got to just got to continue to burn those wheels kind of thing. Well, so so there's this really interesting principle that was written about uh, maybe before this, but but um, I love this book that was written in 1960 called Psycho Cybernetics. What a weird name, but 1960. So weird. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> before self-help up. was a thing or anything like that. But but there are all these principles that have to do with uh, guiding, guiding mechanisms. And the, the explanation that they use, which I love, is if you think about um, an, uh, an interceptor missile. So, so, you know, if you're World War II and, and you're, on a, you're in a plane or on a ship and someone fires a missile at you, you need your missile to hit that missile. Your missile is moving really darn fast. <laughs> Their missile is moving really darn fast. How the heck... Yeah. Before computers and stuff, did they have these things hit each other? Well, they would have, you know, they would be moving forward and the wind is buffeting them around and they're constantly going off course. And they would have these little servos kind of help redirect the missile to whatever target it needed. It turns out that in our, in our minds and the way that humans are built is we also have this guiding mechanism. So if we think about setting a goal or we can visualize a goal, and we believe in all confidence that it will happen, every time something bad happens, you know, the missile gets knocked a little bit to the, you know, it, it hits a turbulence, or it goes a little bit here, or the other missile moves a little direction, like it's constantly correcting its course. So we have the ability, you said you're going to be successful, and I felt this little shiver. I felt this little shiver because I believe you. I believe that you believe you will be successful. And if you have a, a, a vision in your head of what that looks like and you believe it will happen, when a, when a turbulence comes, when something happens, when something knocks you out of the way, it's just this little course correction. It, it's, it's not going to stop you. It's not going to make you crumble. It's just going to course correct you. And if you think about this, where all of these little things you continually course correct until you hit your goal, your goal is almost guaranteed to happen. Now, it may not happen the way you thought it would or even how quickly. You might think 12 months, it might take you 10 years. But if you hold firm to that goal and you believe it'll happen and you just continue to take steps towards it and correct when bad things come along, one day you will find yourself realizing, hey, that thing that I thought about doing, I just pulled it off. I just did it. And I have lived this other people have lived this. S- studies, social science studies have proven that this is the case. And so I take a, a tremendous amount of comfort in knowing that if I just have that vision and believe it enough and take steps towards it and don't stop, it's going to all work out. You know, the, the way I equate that too is for anybody that's listening has ever played sports before or, or maybe golf, right? You vision yourself making the putt or you vision yourself making the free throw. That's exactly what we're kind of talking about when we're thinking of, you know, positive mindsets and thinking of your future. Really, and when I say I'm going to be successful, I truly believe like I'm working towards my success continuously every day because to your point, Mark, I'm putting the roadblocks, right? I'm building the roadblocks in. Certainly sometimes those rocks might chip and I need to pivot to the left or right to find a different, you know, avenue. Nonetheless, I'm still moving forward. And that's that's the goal, right? The goal is if you're constantly learning every day and you're constantly improving every day. And, and I hope this podcast too is kind of a help, help improvement for, for some of these folks that are listening to take some of these tidbits from these entrepreneurs and really leverage them in life because we, we don't know everything, right? Nobody knows everything, but I do know a little bit and whatever little bit I know, I'm going to hopefully share with you and, and then get gain some more insight from people like Mark here to really continue to move forward because what motivates me more than anything is seeing my community continue to grow with me. I always I always talk about climbing the corporate ladder 
And I'm always talking about, you know, grabbing people below me and helping them climb up that corporate ladder. Because one day, Mark, one day I know this will happen. My foot is going to slip down a rung and I'm going to fall down that corporate ladder one day. And it's going to be the hands that I help pull up. They're going to reach out to help me from stop and falling. And so building these networks are very important. Now, what motivates you, Mark? What motivates you to keep going, to keep building? You, you went through the pandemic. You had to release, what, 80 some, all 85 and almost 90% of your staff. What motivates you to keep going? Well, uh, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I love building things. I love helping people. But um, I realized just, just a few months ago, I was, I was down in Tampa hosting a three-day mastermind. I, I connected with this great guy. He has a mastermind group. I came down there and I was out on a Sunday morning uh, in Tampa, like right, right on the bay. And I went out for a run. And somewhere along that run, I realized that I used to be an ambitious person. I used to be really ambitious. My wife in high school, when she, when she, one, one of the things that she, that attracted her the most was just like, she calls it cocky, but I say <laughs> ambitious. <laughs> I, I feel but, you on that one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, you know, overly confident. But, but I was, I was an ambitious person, and I think anyone who's listening who feels like they're, they know they're built for greatness, they have high hopes, they know, they just, they just know there's something within them where they know they are meant to do really big things. I always had that, but for some reason, as my, as my um, goals and my dreams got bigger and bigger and bigger and scarier and scarier and scarier. For some reason, they became, I became, they became more out of reach. And I hit this place where, where I realized that I was not sure that these things would happen. Like, like I want to set a really big dream, but what's the point of setting the dream if it's not going to happen? What's the point of working towards it if I don't think it's possible? And so on this run, I realized that my ambition is one of my greatest assets. And for some reason, through stories from people in my life, or somehow I was conditioned to feel that ambition is greed and ambition is wrong, and, and, it, and it's a terrible thing. And so I've really embraced that ambition. Um, and when you ask what motivates me, first of all, I'm ambitious, and I'm going to own that, and I'm not going to apologize for that, because I know that the more that I do, the greater the gifts are to the people that I work with, uh, the greater the gifts are to my kids to my maybe potential future grandkids, to my wife, um, and to myself. And the people I work with, the people I help, the people I connect with, my audience, my kids, my wife, myself, we, we deserve these things. We're not entitled to them, but, but we deserve those things. And so that's first. And then the second is I am very, and, and this is very uncomfortable for me to say, I'm very motivated by recognition. Mm, now, yeah. now, a lot of us are, yeah. right? But I spent, again, 10, 15 years like the ambition. I spent a lot of time thinking, well, um, gosh, that's shallow. And I want people to look at me and like me. Like, ooh, that's not right. Like, so I work to suppress the, the, the fact that I, I actually am motivated by recognition. I am motivated by people thinking I'm smart or recognizing that the work I do is really good um, or liking what I'm putting out. And I'm motivated by change. And so... I spent 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, maybe my whole life looking at the ambition and the recognition and the change as, as things that were, that were immoral or, um, or superficial or shallow or materialistic. And, and I didn't want to be that person. And I've spent the last bunch of months going, no, no, no. If I'm ambitious and I have more, how much more can I give? Yeah. If, if I actually am motivated by recognition and I accept the recognition, but I turn the spotlight onto the things that matter the most, how can that serve others? Yes. And if I go. love change and I embrace change because change is amazing, most people aren't comfortable with change, but I love change. So how quickly can I change and how quickly can I help other people change? Because what an amazing gift. And it was that little tweak in my mind, that little way change of looking at it to suddenly realize these things that motivate me can be for evil or can be for good. Yeah, that, that's very true. In fact, you know, for the listeners at home, this is exactly how you overcome imposter syndrome. 
this is exactly how you overcome imposter syndrome. In fact, uh, at the beginning of this episode, I asked Mark, I was like, hey, Mark, how do I pronounce your last name? He's like, I'll just pronounce. I was like, no, I want to know exactly how I pronounce your name because having your name pronounced correctly, it also helps you feel confidence about yourself. Now, Mark Mark has been telling you guys, Now, I hope you guys really listen because he's dropping some gems for you all right now. What you're really talking about is being able to, I'm sure some of the younger listeners might understand this, but flex on them. When you do something that is really, if you actually go out and do public speaking, like for example, I I don't do this often enough on my social channels. I do it on LinkedIn. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, you probably see this often. I've been to Missouri, did national presentations. I'm going to Atlanta, did a national presentation. I recently presented at Stanford University, doing all these different presentations throughout the world or throughout the country. But I don't really talk about them, but I do on LinkedIn. And the reason I talked about them on LinkedIn is because I tie it back to my organization and I tie it back to the mission, right? So even though I'm out there building the Gabe Flores brand or the Gabriel Flores brand out in these different locations talking about our healthcare. In fact, Mark's probably sitting here right now. We're on a YouTube or a Zoom and he sees my degree hanging up because again, I like my recognition. So I'm hanging up my degree. So he sees it. I see his awards behind him as well, right? We're, we're showing those things off. But it's not that we're cocky or conceited is because we've earned these. We've we've really worked toward this kind of area that we want to show it off. And we don't show it off to be cocky and, and say, hey, look at what we've done. We're doing it because this is something we've accomplished. And take those accomplishments. I think there's so often where, especially now, you know, Mark, you kind of alluded to it, where we're in this uh, kind of a society where people don't really want to hear about the individual accolades, right? They don't want you to kind of pound your chest unless oddly enough, unless you're a a billionaire and you make electric cars, then apparently you can totally pound your chest and people will be fine with that or something. I'm not sure, but here's the thing, folks, if you do something well and you do something, take pride in that, show it off. I'm not saying like go and, Oh, this is me. And this is all I things I do, but make sure you tie it back to the cause of why you did it. Hey, I'm out here doing this presentation talking about melanoma because I want people to get their skin cancer. I'm out here talking about outreach and because I want rural communities in our state to have access to the best medical they possibly can, even though they don't live next to a Portland metro area or a metro area, right? And so having these conversations and, and really kind of championing what you've done, it's not being cocky. It's not being conceited. It's truly just being a champion to your own of what you're doing and really rewarding your hard work. Because again, the reward for our job well done is the opportunity to do more. And so if you continue to do great work, you're going to continue to get opportunities. And that's why I'm not trying to be conceited and say, I believe I'm going to be successful because I'm constantly going out there trying to build networks, trying to build relationships trying to better the community, not because it's better in me, because it's benefit to me, it's because it's a benefit to all of us, right? I talk about we're a global community of entrepreneurs. And so that's why it's really important that we do kind of highlight our wins and and, and what we're doing and really have a dialogue of like, hey, how do we how do I also do that? Right. I've I've had so many conversations with entrepreneurs after the shows. Hey, give me some free Give me some free advice. Give me some free game, man. Tell me, tell me how I can continue to improve and get better. How do I continue to do, you know, what you guys are doing now? Now, Mark, as a small business owner, we go through a lot, right? We have these pitfalls. We have these grand ideas. What keeps you up at night as a small business owner? So one of my deepest fears is that I think like many of us, that we just won't be good enough. Yes, and, yes. you know, ultimately, almost if you look at psychology, every single fear comes back to, you know, I won't be enough of whatever version that is, dot, dot, dot. So therefore, I can't be loved. Right. Everything comes back to, well, then I won't be loved. And so my 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 biggest fear and, and I don't know where this comes from, but it still keeps me up at night and it keeps me small and it keeps me thinking small and it keeps me from taking risks. We talked about risks earlier, is that um, I. I won't have people who can help me do what we need to do. I won't be able to find them. Or if I can find them, when it comes time to do the project or do the work, they won't be there for me. Or it just won't be good enough. And then when that happens, it's going to be all on my shoulders. And it's such a heavy burden to carry everything on your shoulders. And what if I can't figure it out? What if I'm not good enough? What if it won't work? 
And if that's the case, then the project or the, or the initiative will fall apart. And if it falls apart, I'm going to let people down and I'm going to ruin my name and it's, it's going to be terrible. And if that's the case, then dot, 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 you know, I won't be loved or whatever it is. So even today, the, th- the, the thing that keeps me up at night is the, is the what if I can't find people who can help me? What if people who say they will help me won't be there for me when I need the most? And I'm sure this is something that has to do with my childhood in some way. But, <laughs> but this, this idea of being left all on your own or being abandoned or just not living up to the expectations, uh, I have to imagine it's one of the most universal fears. But, but it's not, can I get financing? Because I'm deep enough in my business now and my network is strong enough. And I've, I've, I've grown my company the wrong way enough times that now and I've learned what the right way is that I have a lot of confidence in certain things that, that maybe if you're starting, you don't have, but the thing that keeps me up at night is still the like, gosh, so hard to find good people. And that's a terrible thing to put out there. Cause it's not true. There are amazing people everywhere. It's easy to find great people when you treat them with respect and when you pay them well, and when there's exciting work and good projects. So like, I know that the stuff that keeps me up at night is just total bullshit, and yet it's still the thing that keeps me up at night. If I circle back around one year from now, I can guarantee you that I will have broken through this because now that I'm aware of it, now that I know that that's the case and I get really uncomfortable, that I lean into that discomfort because I know, I know that that's just my, um, my, my body, my anxiety, my, my fight or flight mode trying to protect me, but protect me it's not going to help me drive forward. It's going to keep me exactly where I am. So I know within a year I will have crushed this, but right now this is what bothers me still. You know, maybe, maybe in a year we'll do a, we'll do a recap. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start reaching out to some of our former guests. I'm like, Hey, where are you at from a year from ago? Like, let's, let's rechat. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things you mentioned, you know, things that keep you up at night, I, I realized that worrying works, you know, just, just worrying about it because everything I worry about never happens. It seems like, <laughs> I, I always say, don't worry about stuff because, and this is something I've learned, like, like we worry and worry and worry and, and we're a worry society and, a, and an anxiety nation. I have GAD, I have generalized anxiety disorder. So it goes beyond just worrying. But, but here's, here's the biggest truth of it all. What you are worrying about is not the thing that's going to mess you up. The things that mess you up are the things that you could never see coming. You would never see it coming. And it's the thing that really messes you up. It's out of your control. You would have never seen it coming. And so, so like, quite honestly, the stuff that you're worrying about, go fix those things. Sure. You know, don't ignore them. Don't let your business burn down to the ground. Don't do bad work or bad delivery or ignore, you know, operations or processes, but fix that. But really, those are not the things that are going to knock you down. You know, this side of the pandemic, I think it's pretty obvious to say, like, no, you know, other than maybe the CDC and some weird scientists in Sweden or something, no one really saw that one coming. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it, it, when a recession comes, recessions are cyclical. And when inflation goes up, inflation is cyclical. And when, you know, uh, geopolitical things happen, that's the same thing. And like, there's certain things that you can just count on will happen every seven or eight or 10 or 15 or 20 years, right? You know, every 30 years, things will happen over and over and over again. So these those surprises aren't really even surprises. The things that are really going to mess you up, you'd never have seen coming. Yeah, that's very true. In fact, folks, if you're looking at the market and you're seeing it's red, that's a great day to buy some stocks. I'm looking at the market if like- If you have oh, cash on hand. If you have cash on hand, of course, yes. <laughs> Let's always remember that. When people say like, buy, 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 it's like for some of us, you know, like if you're starting a business or whatever, don't buy, don't yeah, buy, don't yeah. buy. Invest in yourself. <laughs> Especially with the inflation rate. Just do not buy it. <laughs> especially on credit. So how let's, let's drop some knowledge to the listeners. Let's give them some advice. How do even myself, how, how do you continue to grow the brand? How do you continue to make sure that folks are aware of what you're doing? Yeah. So, so there's a few things. Um, first of all, uh, and, and I ignored so many of these rules early on and I embracing them. I am embracing them so hardcore right now. So, so you need to be able to differentiate yourself from the crowd. So the thought of looking at what everyone else is doing and kind of copying them or even being inspired by them, if you're lucky, you will be as good as them. But if you're as good as them, let's, let's take a mechanic, for example. I'm a brand new mechanic. 
I start my auto body shop or I start my mechanic shop or whatever. And I, I want to go ahead and be just as good as the guy down the street. If I'm just as good as that guy down the street. There's no reason to pick me. Like there's no compelling reason to pick me. And so what, what you want to do whenever you're starting is you want to niche, you want to niche down. It feels so limiting, right? If I'm going to be the mechanic who starts, maybe I'm only going to focus on European cars. Maybe I'm only going to focus on BMWs. Maybe I'm only going to focus on convertibles, right? Like maybe, maybe I'm going to be the, the only the European convertible rear engine mechanic. Now that seems so limiting, right? Like it's like, but, but there's all of these other people out there and that's cool, but that is the fastest way to be just like everyone else. You don't want to be like everyone else. You want to be different. You want to, you want to stand out in some way. So, so be whatever version of you, like really let that spill out or pick the thing that you can niche down on. If you want to become the world's greatest photographer, awesome. But it would be easier to become like, if you're really into bowling, you know, like to become the world's greatest bowling photographer. Because in that bowling community, you're going to go to very selective events and you're going to meet a very selective group of people and it's going to help you grow so much quicker. So niche down, be different. The, The next thing that you need to do is, is you cannot underestimate the importance of social proof. So getting onto podcasts or starting your own podcast is amazing because, because you, there's this spillover effect. You know, I, I, I'm the host of We Do Hard Things, this podcast, and for about a year and a half now, I think we're 80 episodes in, about a year and a half now, we've, we've been putting out episodes, but we're laddering up our guests. You know, the, the first few guests we had were amazing people, but we have more famous guests now. And, you know, a year ago, I got Les Brown on the podcast because I was working with him and doing some stuff with our team. And we had him on the podcast. Great conversation. People still today, still today go like, you had Les Brown on the podcast? That's great. He's he's awesome. But we, but if someone's going to say yes or no to coming onto my podcast, they're going to look at my guest list. They're going to see the names and they're going to go, oh, come on there. So, so the spillover effect of being around people, of being seen at events or around people. Um, having testimonials or social proof, having PR, having, and, and, and it might be totally overwhelming to you to think, how do I do all of these things and invest in all of these things and what have you? Just pick something that you love, that you're really good at, and just start laddering up. And, and some of this stuff isn't even that challenging. You know, if, if I'm like, like, I'm on your podcast, I might take your podcast logo and say that I was featured on your podcast. Now, that's really important for people who listen to your podcast. But even the tens of thousands or maybe even millions of people who don't listen to the podcast, it's still super valuable because yeah, it proves it's, it's that I'm capable totally. of being on the podcast. And Very I, good point. so many people underestimate the need for, for those we work with or those we're trying to connect with to have that social proof. You know, that, you that talked about traveling. I'm totally right? like, still in that. <laughs> Do it, do it, do it right away, right? Like, so, so you, you, you know, you talked about being on the stages and only sharing things to LinkedIn. If you want to be a speaker, I better see some photos of you on stages. Yeah. Doesn't matter how big or small the room is. I better see that though. Like, you, you better show that to me. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to an event next week. This is a perfect example. I would never have done this before, but if you'll give me two minutes. Yeah. Through my network, I have a really good friend who uh, owns an event space in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he and I are really, really, really good friends. Um, We become good friends because he has a podcast. I have a podcast over the last two years. And uh, over the last two years, I've just helped him and helped him. And he's helped me. Last October, he knows that I want to host more events. He was hosting a a three-day event. Tom and Lisa Bill, you are there. And all of these people are there. And he put me on stage. He gave me the opportunity. Well, he's hosting this event um, for a book launch for really big names in the self-help space. So we're talking Ed Milet and Marie Forleo and Mel Robbins um, and Jim Quick. And uh, gosh, there's going to be a whole bunch of people there. I know that this event is happening. So I reach out to my friend and I say, I say, can I come and help? Can I come and help? Right? I will fly myself down. I will put myself up. You don't have to pay me. I don't care if I'm sweeping the floors. Can I come and help? And he's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, security, I'm not sure. Well, he said, yeah, okay, Mark, you, you can come and help. Now, the ego side of me <laughs> goes, like, <laughs> goes like, I should be hosting this thing. I should be on stage. Like, I'm going to be down there, like, literally maybe even just passing out pamphlets or something, right? Yeah. Like, I'm volunteering my time. But I want to serve them. 
I want to help out. But more than that, here's what I know. I'm going to be able to tell this story forever. You know, um, uh, people who were on Oprah in 1998, like 15 years later, they were still selling the product saying, as seen on Oprah. They were answering the phone saying, oh, you probably saw us on Oprah. <laughs> right? Like, like 15 years later, they're like, oh, oh, you were on Oprah. Right? Like Brilliant. Said, I know that, that I am going to be able to spend the day like one-on-one because I've been put in a position where I get to work with these people with Ed Milet and Mel Robbins and, and Marie Forleo and Jim Quick and all of these people. And I know that I am going to, even earlier, I mentioned Les Brown, right? And I slipped in there like, oh, we were working with him. And in you know, August, I went to his, one of his events in Queens and I helped them host this event. Like forever, I will be able to tell that story. Yeah. And what does that do to my credibility or perceived credibility? I'm not saying we're best friends. I'm not saying that, you know, that like I changed their world. I'm saying I will be able to say forever. You know, when I was at Ed Milet's book launch, uh, I was hanging out in the room with and then fill in the blank of whatever's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But up until quite recently, I would not have taken the risk of asking. I would not have taken the risk of spending all of this money to, and, and all of this time that I'm pulling out of my business to go to this event with, without really any... Like, I don't even know what's going to happen. I literally may just be the dude sweeping the floors. <laughs> and if that's the case, I'm okay with that. But I think I'm going to actually be able to make some great connections. I'm going to be able to network. And I'm going to have some amazing stories that I will be able to share for a long time that will only just help me build my credibility in this thing that we're doing. And, and yeah, you can call it shallow, but, but this is important. You know, people say don't judge a book by a cover. But every single one of us judges every single book by its cover. Yep. That's why covers get designed. <laughs> so that's, that's why movies have movie posters and they have yeah. trailers. Like we can all think we've risen above this, but that's not true. This is really important stuff. So true. that's my advice for anyone starting. Just it's so incredibly uncomfortable, but just start doing it. Yeah. In fact, you know, folks at home, you may not know this. But when you go on Netflix and you log on to Netflix, depending on who it is that logged in, what user account, so if I log in or my wife logs in, the cover of the movie will be different. So I bet you some of you folks may not know this, and you're probably going to go home on Netflix or log in different accounts and look at the same exact movie, and they're going to be different covers. The reason for it is target marketing. One photo for if it might be a male audience, maybe it's a more of attractive female, like more action type of thing. And if, if it's a female, it might be more skewed to a female audience. And it's, it's very true. It, it, it's marketing is very unique, you know, and, and you're constantly, you're constantly uh, uh, evolving. And then niche down is a very good point, you know, really kind of finding that unique niche that uh, what, what can you do in that niche that is best for, you know, what, how can you be the best that, that niche essentially, you know? So how, for the listeners at home, how can they get in contact with Mark? If they want to hear more, how do they contact you? Where's your website? Do you have social channels? How can they, how can they find more information about you? Well, if, if you're interested in, in learning more about how you can stand out, how you can connect with your audience, how you can develop a brand that really stands out, we have this free download called the badass business brand um, uh, playbook. And you can go ahead over to Fanta.com. That's spelled P-H-A-N-T-A, but Fanta.com. Uh, you can head over there and you can download that free guide. If you're interested in the podcast, We Do Hard Things, go over to YouTube, look up We Do Hard Things or my name, Mark Drager. Or if you just want to connect with me one-on-one, you can head over to my Instagram. I'm at Mark Drager. And just send me a DM. You know, I, if, if, you, if you reference this podcast, I'll send you back a voice note because I don't have automation. I don't have a VA. I don't have any of that fancy stuff. When it's me responding, it might take nice. a day or two, but when it's me responding, it's me. So I like it. I'd love to hear from you. Perfect. And so what I'll do, Mark, is I'll actually put that, um, I'll put a link to that free uh, brochure that you mentioned in the, the booklet on the newsletter. So folks listening, if you have not signed up for the newsletter yet, please do sign up for the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. You can do that at theshadesofe.com. We will have Mark's information on there on next uh, before his episode launches, and then it will actually be on there for continuous weeks because what we do is we do a before, during, and after. And so it will showcase the 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 guest that was coming before. That would be the, the week after, I mean, the current guest, then the week before. And so you'll have uh, three opportunities to actually be showcased on the newsletter. And then, uh, yeah, Mark, thank you so much. This has been 
great, great conversation. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I think I have a feeling you and I are going to probably be connecting a little bit more offline <laughs> at some point in time too. So I would love to kind of get a little bit more of this, uh, get on this public public speaking train and have a little bit more insight into what that looks like. Because I think uh, I think that's where our worlds might collide a little bit more again. I love it, Gabe. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for everything you do. I mean. You know, there's there's a lot of voices out there, but you've built such a unique community. So for, for all of those who are listening, you know, make sure that you send Gabe a quick note or, or maybe head over to iTunes and leave him a review. I mean, oh, he's not, I he may not ask it. for it, but I'm going to say man. leave him a review because it, it means the world for all of us who are doing stuff. You know, just that comment. Like I, I get them every now and again. Just that comment. We, we realize that that we are speaking out to this world and we're not sure if it matters sometimes we're not sure if it's landing we we question if it's if it's worth it so if if gabe's done anything to help you in any way send him a note be nice to him and he'll appreciate hey, it mark i love you thank you so much that is very true because i truly don't know who's all listening so for the folks that are listening thank you again so much i really do hope that we continue to provide some value to you in these these uh, podcasts are informative but more importantly i hope you're able to get out and support some of these entrepreneurs because they're doing some amazing work and they have some phenomenal stories and as mark was actually saying earlier learn from our mistakes you know take these take these conversations and learn from them and you know do what we're doing but better right or, or avoid what we did that, that maybe got us in a couple of troubles. <laughs> so Mark, thank you again so much for taking the time to be in on the show. For those at home, you can visit me on the shades of e.com or you can visit us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the shades of e on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit the shades of e.com.